I understand. Do you? Do you? This is it. I'm telling you, this is it. One of my favourite movie clips there, that's from the movie Margin Call and Jeremy Irons getting a bit heated. We're in a similar situation to what's going on in that movie. There are people right now, CEOs strategizing and creators creating. There are authors out there writing. And all the time, artificial intelligence, AI, is ready, it's here. This is being filmed in July 2021. And we've come a really, really long way. Have a look at Lita. We're walking through Kings Park, we see this tree. What is it? That's a gum tree, eucalyptus, the most important plant in Australia and a symbol of Western Australia. The genus is extremely diverse with more than 700 species and is present on all continents except Antarctica. As we're making our way home, I get a message on my phone. It says, call me now. Uh, it's from my brother. What does it mean? Maybe he wants to have a chat with you. It's possible he wants to talk about something serious. So you can see we've come a lot further than Amazon Alexa or Apple Siri or Google in terms of asking questions and it just going out to the internet and finding an answer. That's not what's happening anymore. AI is at a stage where it can process and output language far, far better than a human. In fact, I'm leading a project at the moment where we're going to IQ test the brain behind Lita. And the brain behind Lita is by an organization called OpenAI, and they've called this brain Generative Pre-Trained Transformer 3, but for short it's GPT-3. Not a great name, not a memorable name, but this is the code word that you might be hearing around the internet at the moment. And many experts are saying that the brain behind Lita, this GPT-3, is sufficiently advanced to be able to be used immediately in the real world. The co-founder of an organization called Eleutha AI, uh, and also the creator of GPT-J, an alternative to GPT-3, says it really, really differently. He says, I think GPT-3 is Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. In many ways, it's more purely intelligent than humans are. I think humans are approximating what GPT-3 is doing, not vice versa. We'll have a deeper look into that brain in a moment. A very, very long time ago, we've had the agrarian revolution. Of course, we've been through the industrial revolution in different stages and phases. We've had more recently the information revolution and we've seen the internet come to life more exciting than any of those is what is happening right now in the artificial intelligence revolution it's both exciting confronting and it's going to change our biology it's going to change the way that we be a lot of the experts that are out there from OpenAI, from Eleutha AI they have these really well-rounded backgrounds for example, Jeremy Howard has a, an arts background. There are people that have built in psychology or psychiatric backgrounds where they're able to go a little bit deeper and extend rather than just having pure mathematics. Here's a very brief look at where I've come from. I do have the computer science background. I was coding very early chatbots, which might be seen as the, the precursor of AI, back in the very early 90s using QBasic. I've had memberships with the IEEE, with the IET, and I've spent time with massive organizations, including Mensa International, uh, some backing from the fellowship of the Institute of Coaching at Harvard Medical School. I've also had the privilege of jumping in with super high performers, some of the heaviest hitters in the world, while I've been playing with human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Talking about people like Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber in Asia, Sir James Dyson's family office right the way through the UK and a bunch more. If you're interested in name dropping, please go and have a further look at my background. But what this brings is an insight outside of just raw computer science and data science. This is not even adding philosophy on top of that. This is adding personal development, the concept of coaching out of Harvard Medical School and some others right into artificial intelligence. And in all my work with 
high performers with these huge, huge brains, people that have become professors in their 20s, or people that can solve Rubik's Cubes blindfolded, or people that are changing the world, it's been fascinating to see what the limitations are there and where we're at in terms of bringing in artificial intelligence and completely replacing or at least supplementing biological intelligence. Also consider how AI can level the playing field and I've talked a lot about this in my article The Rising Tide Lifting All Boats. Prodigies that I've worked with are in the top say 99.99th percentile of the population. They're way, way up there when we're talking about cognitive ability or intellectual ability. And that means they can do things like memorize data 12 times faster than someone else in their classroom or just process four times faster and being able to work at that speed. That's now essentially irrelevant now that we've got AI and as we move into having integrated AI and replacing our biological intelligence or at least supplementing our biological intelligence with access to super intelligence. One of the best people to listen to in this field is Professor Ray Kurzweil at Google at the moment. Quite a while ago, in the early 2000s, he told us that there are no inherent barriers to our being able to reverse engineer the operating principles of human intelligence and then replicate these capabilities in the more powerful computational substrates. Now, 16 years later, we're absolutely doing so. Have a look at the NVIDIA data center that's been installed in Cambridge that is gonna help power and train some of these massive AIs. And we're not too far off already, again, as of July 2021, in being able to predict human brain activity. So the GPT models successfully and accurately predict human brain activity with up to 100% predictivity. These language model architectures alone with random weights can yield representations that match human brain data well. And that is from last year. So we're already at a place where the very basic ideas that we have for these AI models, just feeding it data, are replicating how the human brain works. And how the human brain works in the most simplistic terms is taking input, processing it, and generating output. Now, of course, there's more complexity than that, but we're already seeing how these models are basically taking in language and feeding out language and it being more effective than any human on Earth. There have been early adopters all the way through history. We talked about the agrarian, the industrial, the information revolutions. And if you're listening, if you're looking at what's going on, you will be able to jump in earlier than others. I've had a really good track record in predicting or finding things ahead of the curve, of being quite early in terms of adoption, but also in finding good ways of applying that early. Have a look at the chart of some of the things I've got a head start on. You might have something similar in your own life, so this is to compare with what's going on for you as well. I was using the Apple iBook clamshell model back in 1999. I was invited by Biz Stone to join Twitter in the mid 2000s. I bought Bitcoin in 2011 off Mt. Gox, sat in a Tesla the, the following year, and I had the early developer's kit of the Oculus Rift before that exploded. It's possible that I was an average of five to seven years early in a lot of those things. I don't think I'm that early for calling AI as being ready right now because of the exponential pace of change, because of this speed of bringing technology to the front. So OpenAI's GPT-3 model is only about 12 months old. It was launched in May 2020, and now it's driving things like helping human programmers write code. There are several books that have been written by GPT-3. This is the first book written by GPT-3, Pharmaco AI, and it was written or co-authored with one of the guys behind Google AI and the team there. It's a fascinating book. It is 
very, very deep and not what you would expect from a computer, but we're not really talking about a computer anymore. These are some of the other books that have been written in the last 12 months by GPT-3. The AI has been a co-author in things like dictionaries, in places like fiction and non-fiction, and it's drawing from such a huge data set, a huge source, that it's really quite brainy. What's inside its brain? This is always a fascinating question to me. GPT-3's brain is a little bit different in terms of where we got the data from. But I wanted to know exactly where we got this data from. And I want to caveat this with, there may be new revisions of my charts and presentation of this. This is one of the ways of looking at it. This is the top 10 data sets behind GPT-3. And you'll see things like academic sources as the number one, unpublished books, which was very easy to draw from, whether it's 100,000 plus books, they're authors that have self-published and put their stuff in the public domain, allowed those books to be digested by GPT-3. Wikipedia is often a huge source for these big models because it's reliable these days, whether school teachers would say so or not, it's absolutely a solid source for facts. Then there's a bunch of news sources. Have a look at HuffPost, New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, The Guardian. And there's a huge source there in both GPT-3 and GPT-J drawing on patterns because of the written style of these, and again, the fact that they're in the public domain, and that means that they make up a huge percentage of these data sets. So both GPT-3 and GPT-J drawing on these very formalized written patterns. Here's a different view of the brain inside GPT-3, and it's got a comparison to GPT-J. Uh, so you'll notice that Common Crawl, which is a version of the internet that's been crawled by a robot over the last decade or so, huge amount of data, and obviously takes into account the most visited pages. Both models use a source called WebText, which is effectively Reddit upvoted submissions of links around the internet. So they're using social media upvotes to determine what is and what is not important to go and have a crawl around. You'll notice GPT-J is a bit more transparent with their sources as well, and that they have a broader range of academic sources that they've weighted more heavily. And the Western world doesn't have a monopoly on these language models, on this AI. Of course, the Chinese, the South Koreans, and essentially anywhere that has access to massive computing is jumping on board here and is already using AI for different tasks. So the Chinese models are a bit more opaque. Let's have a look at what they've told us so far. You'll notice similarly to GPT-3, one called Pangu Alpha is also using Common Crawl and jumping around the internet, but they've used some of their local sources, including Chinese news and Chinese encyclopedias. The huge model, Udao 2.0, which powers a virtual student called Zhibinghua, has released next to zero information. So this is the information that I've got available where they've gone and crawled encyclopedias, news sources, and Q&A forums like Quora to be able to have Uda 2.0 answering any question, being able to have really deep conversations and having access to a huge portion of Chinese literature, both, both online and offline. We're at a point right now where AI is ready where AI is being used by countries, by organizations, by companies, by individuals in ways that will serve humanity. Being able to replace tasks, processes that humans would normally do, but it's a bit of a waste of time for us, so why not offload it? This is nearly everywhere. So it's not just in the books that we've looked at. It's not just in the written word, being able to allow authors more breadth in their writing. It's also in places like legal services, where it's helping with review for discovery and litigation and outcome prediction, uh, or automated device and document creation. 
It's certainly right the way through counselling and you'll see that it's been looked at for primary components of psychology and therapy. So assessment, formulation, intervention and evaluation of outcome, all of these parts of psychology and psychotherapy can be replaced with AI and are being replaced with AI. It's also right the way through the performing arts. You might have already seen news channels using AI as the avatar to present the news. It's in voice acting. We've got AI replacing speakers, even sounding even better than Lita, even though she sounds amazing. We've got it in music and composing. So you can ask an AI to generate a song for you or fit it to a particular timeline. So if you've got a three minute 30 YouTube clip, you can ask the AI to create the music at that exact time. In fact, PwC has predicted that AI will contribute around $16 trillion to the world economy in the next, say, nine years or so. About seven trillion of that is from increased productivity as we automate our processes and augment our labor forces. It's an exciting time and I wanted to give a brief overview in this video and then deep dive into different parts of it in subsequent videos. If you haven't seen Lita, please go and have a look at her complete series. You can find different topics that she talks about listed in the title and we walk around and she's able to provide best practice responses, uh, etc. But there are even more advanced AIs out there. We're not talking about IBM Watson anymore. We're not just answering facts. We're going way down into the depths and being able to process like a human brain. It's incredible. We'll also have a closer look at the most life-changing applications of AI. So consider being able to talk to dead relatives by feeding their material into an AI. Consider how this might be advantageous to your entire household, especially if it's built into your brain. So you're able to ask AI what to do, what to say in a particular conversation. And of course you're able to accept or reject that. This is it, this is the fire alarm. You're being given a gift here to jump into this earlier than say what the media might be telling you or even what your job might be telling you. This is a really, really exciting time to be alive. This is like going back into the Baroque period and training with one of the masters because you've got complete access to this now. You've got uh, a bird's eye view of the revolution.